Okay, hello, Ijeng 2202 Dynamics, Georgia Southern University, Armstrong Campus. So last week we looked at the relationship between the velocities for two points on a rigid body, or the relationship between the accelerations for two points on a rigid body. And note that the rigid body in this case was translating and rotating. Clearly, if it's translating only, then there's no real relationship outside of the fact that all the velocities will be equal and all the accelerations will be equal. But now we're incorporating rotation as well as translating translation. And we noted that those velocities and accelerations at different points will not necessarily be equal. Then we said, what if there is something on the body that is actually moving relative to the body or you can think of it as relative to a fixed reference frame that is on the body and when we delved into that sort of uh, scenario we derived the equations 17.11 or 17.11 um, we had the relationship between the velocities but we also had to include the velocity of the body or i'm sorry the velocity of the point that was moving relative to the body okay so suppose there was a roach on the body and the roach was moving or some type of insect and at a specific point in time the roach was at point a now the roach is moving along the body but at some point in time we just happened to capture it capture a photo and at that instant the roach was at point a and we want to say, okay, what would be the velocity of that roach? Well, the velocity of the roach would have, the velocity that the roach would have, would have to be include the velocity of the body because it's on the body. So it'd have to include really the velocity of point A because it's on point A. But it would also have to include the velocity that the roach has relative to the body itself. Or the velocity that roach has relative to a body fixed reference frame that is a fixed reference frame on the body so let's go over that the roach has the velocity of point a because it is on point a at this instant and point a is moving it's translating and rotating is it not but it also has its own relative velocity relative to the body or the body fixed reference frame so that is that VA relative term, the velocity of the roach relative to the body. Now, what about this, these other things over here? Well, we looked at this equation last time, you know, for a body that's translating and rotating, the relationship between the velocities of two points, between two points were given by this expression, VA equals VB plus omega cross R, A relative to B. So we looked at that before. So we know that the velocity of point A itself is going to be the velocity of point B plus omega cross RA relative to B. So that's the velocity of point A. And then, of course, we have to add in, if we're looking at the velocity of the roach that's moving along the body and passing through point A at that instant, we have to add in its own relative velocity. And that, of course, is relative to the body or you can think of it as a secondary reference frame that is fixed to the body and then we said that if we differentiate the velocity equation we'll arrive at the acceleration relationship which is down here very similar to what we looked at when we looked at the acceleration relationship between two points on a rigid body the only difference here is of course we have that a that acceleration relative acceleration term now this would be what this would be the acceleration of the roach or the insect relative to the body or you can think of it as relative to the body fixed reference frame we also had a new term in here this two omega cross va relative that we'll talk about shortly this is called our sort of coriolis acceleration um, we have the alpha cross r term and we know from earlier lecture that that is our tangential acceleration and of course we have the omega cross omega cross r term 
And we know from our earlier lecture that that is our acceleration towards the center of rotation, right? So now let us, now that we understand the relationship between velocities and the accelerations, um, between two points uh, relative to a moving reference frame, a yeah, reference frame that the reference frame itself is translating and rotating. Let's look at Newton. Uh, let's, let's revisit Newton's second law and um, see how those relationships can be incorporated into Newton's second law. Because here's the thing remember, we said that Newton's second law applies to an inertial reference frame only, a reference frame that is not rotating. So it doesn't have any angular velocity, angular acceleration, and um, and that is not accelerating in a translational, in a sort of in a translational scenario. There is no translational acceleration. We said that that was the case for an inertial reference frame, and that's when Newton's law. It's okay to apply Newton's second law, um, but you know we apply it all the time to the Earth, um, or using the earth as a, a fixed reference frame but is the earth not accelerating and is the earth not um, rotating and it has some angular velocity um, clearly it does but how can we apply newton's second law and feel comfortable with that so let's look at that right now so what we'll do is we'll start with um, putting a reference frame at the center of the earth and we're going to say that that reference frame is not rotating. So it is accelerating with the center of the earth and as the earth traverses its path and it has acceleration towards the center as well as uh, some type of tangential acceleration. Right? It, is trans it is accelerating because it's fixed to the earth but we're, we're going to say it's a non-rotating reference frame. So, this non-rotating reference frame has some acceleration, has the acceleration that the Earth has, which we're going to denote as g sub b. And that is the acceleration due to the gravitational attractions from the sun and the moon, etc. Okay. Now, suppose we have an object of mass m, you know, some distance away from the Earth. So, the object of mass m has um, external forces acting on it uh, it also has gravitational acceleration due to the sun and the moon and we're going to call that g sub a the sigma f the external forces were going to account for we're also going to incorporate the gravitational acceleration due to the earth on the object but we're going to incorporate that, that's already incorporated in our sigma f here. So if I apply Newton's second law, of course, we're using an inertial reference frame, this fictitious non-rotating or non-accelerating reference frame, it's fixed. Then we can say that the sum of the forces, which would be sigma f, as well as mga, would be equal to the mass multiplied by its acceleration. And of course, this acceleration A sub A is, again, relative to the inertial reference frame. Oops. So, but we also know that the acceleration of A compared to the acceleration of B, we can equate them in terms of some relative acceleration because we can say the acceleration of A is equal to the acceleration of B plus the acceleration of A relative to B. Remember, B is uh, is accelerating, but it is not rotating. All right. So the acceleration of A is equal to the acceleration of B plus the acceleration of A relative to B, which will be given by that, which will be shown here by this term. So if we substitute this expression into the first one, the one at the top here. Okay, 
we end up with our third expression here. So all I'm doing is I'm substituting for a sub a here. Note that a sub b, the acceleration of b, is also the g sub b here, which is a gravitational acceleration. Okay. So, um, you know, on the Earth, due to the sun and the moon, etc. So, when we do that substitution, we end up with this third expression. So, I have sigma f being equal to m a sub a relative. Now, if, we, if g sub b is equal to g sub a, um, we end up with our fourth expression here. Um, g sub b will be equal to g sub a when objects are close to the Earth. So we can always, so note that we can, in this expression here, we'll apply Newton's second law, but we're using this frame that's accelerating, which, you know, we always said we, you know, we can't do that because that's not an inertial reference frame. But we, we see that we can approximate Newton's second law. We can, this is an approximation here because we're saying, well, g sub b is very close to g sub a, then we're okay. So the bottom line is, if we have a reference frame that is centered at the Earth's center, it's not rotating, but it is accelerating at the same rate as the Earth, we can approximate Newton's second law, sigma f equals ma. So we can say, even though this reference frame accelerates, let's fix this up a little bit, even though this, this reference frame accelerates, we can apply Newton's second law using the acceleration measured relative to that reference frame. And that's okay, as long as we're close to the that reference frame, or we're close to this particular reference frame, this Earth-centered non-rotating reference frame. And that will be, if that is the case, then we know the GA will be equal to G sub B. So clearly the argument doesn't work if the object is not close to the Earth. Okay, so now let's look at an Earth-fixed reference frame the origin of that reference frame we'll call B. So it's now fixed to the Earth, which means that it is rotating with the Earth and accelerating with the Earth. Um, we still have our non-rotating Earth-centered reference frame here, the origin O. Okay, so we can say uh, for that object of mass M, for example, let's go back to the object of mass m. Now, we know that we proved earlier relative to the Earth-centered non-rotating frame that sigma f was equal to m, or we could approximate it at least, that sigma f was equal to m a sub a, where this a sub a was relative to the Earth-centered non-rotating reference frame. So we said that earlier. Now we have this moving reference frame. Um, recall our equations regarding two points on a rigid body, but the additional portion where we had um, the body moving, accelerating and translating. So then we could say that there is some relative motion between those two points. And so if we incorporate that equation here for a sub a, we can say that, okay, a sub a is equal to a sub b plus the um, alpha cross r term, which is not shown here because we're assuming a constant angular velocity plus the two omega cross VA relative term, 
plus the omega cross omega cross r term. And if you recall the omega cross omega cross r term, that gave us our acceleration towards the center. The two omega cross VA relative term is what we call the Coriolis acceleration, and we'll discuss that very shortly. And of course, the acceleration of V is the acceleration of V relative to our non-rotating Earth-centered frame. And of course, finally, we have the acceleration of A relative to the moving reference frame. The acceleration of A relative to the moving reference frame. So let's look at those terms individually. Uh, let's look at this omega cross omega cross r term first. If we calculate the um, this cross product, typically we're going to get values on the order of 10 to the minus 5 meters per second squared. Uh, you know, accounting for the angular velocity of the Earth. And even though R can be quite large, the angular velocity of the Earth is very small. Okay. And it's actually bounded by the magnitude of omega E squared times R. Uh, and uh, when we do that calculation, we'll see it's very small. So it's typically we can neglect it relative to the acceleration of A here. Um, similarly, with the 2 omega cross VA relative term, that's called our Coriolis acceleration. Again, we haven't really described that yet, but um, we'll talk about that very shortly in the next slide. Um, it's a cross product, so it's, you know, remember cross product, how that works. It's uh, A cross B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between them. So the maximum value you could have for this 2 omega cross VA relative term would be the magnitude of omega times the magnitude of V relative times 2. Of course, the maximum value of that angle between them, theta, well, would be 90, so sine of 90 is 1. So the maximum value would just be 2 omega E magnitude, V relative magnitude. When we multiply those values, we also get some a magnitude that is substantially smaller than our typical A sub A relative. Finally, let's look at the um, A sub B term, which is the acceleration of the origin at B relative to the center of Earth of the Earth. So let's go back a slide a little bit and look at that. Go back, sorry. Okay, we're saying that the A sub B term here is the acceleration of the rotating uh, reference frame that's fixed to the Earth relative to this Earth-centered non-rotating frame. That's my acceleration of B. And so clearly that, you know, we have rotations, so it's bounded by R omega squared. Its maximum value would be R omega squared. And whenever we calculate that value, we get about 0 0.0337 meters per second squared, which itself cannot, it's not small enough to be ignored. However, normally, um, when we account for local acceleration uh, or the local changes in acceleration due to gravity, um, that incorporating the local changes in acceleration due to gravity, that usually takes care of the um, effect of the A sub B term. So it turns out that we can actually ignore the A sub B term as well. So all these terms on the right uh, can be ignored compared to the A sub A relative, compared to the A sub A relative. So finally, we can actually apply, okay, let's go back here. So we can, we can say for an earth fixed reference frame, we can apply F equals MA, um, which is what we typically do every day. Um, and ignore the rest of these terms. And the A that we are talking about when we say F equal MA is actually relative to a frame that's fixed on the Earth. Okay, so even though the Earth, that frame is accelerating and rotating, uh, we can still apply it generally. If it's 
if it is fixed to the earth. So we can look at our previous equation. And, and, and um, excuse me, we can look at our previous equation here and take all these terms on the right and put them on the left side. So we're going to end up with something like this sigma f minus all those terms we had on the right equals ma sub a relative. Now let's take a look at that 2 omega cross b a relative term that we we've been mentioning um, for on several occasions now. Um, so if you, that term is called our Coriolis acceleration, the 2 omega cross b a relative, or if, if we multiply it by m, then f equals ma. So we also call it a Coriolis force. Uh, this is actually a fictitious force, but it, you know, arranging the equation this way, we can call it the force that is actually um, existing. But it, you know, it's it is fictitious. So let's look at we'll look at y in a second. So let's look at that omega cross v a relative term. Well, let's say um, looking at the Earth and um, the Earth is rotating from west to east. Um, so I have my omega vector here pointing up. Use the right hand rule, and I get that west to east rotation. I have, let's say I'm in the northern hemisphere and I'm going north. I'm in the northern hemisphere and I'm going north. Well, so I have my V a relative vector and my omega e vector. If I do that cross product, omega cross V a relative, using the right hand rule, all right, omega cross V a relative, use that right hand rule, I'll have a vector pointing to the west. So clearly, the negative of the vector will be pointing to the east. The negative of the vector will be pointing to the east. And if I have, so if I have um, a body that is uh, moving north, okay, this cross product, this force here, it seems to be um, pushing my body to the east. So if I'm going north, it would seem like my body is actually, even though I'm going north, I am going along a curved path here to the east. Okay. And we could do the same thing if we're in the northern hemisphere, but we're going south and we get a curved path that way, I'm going to the west. And the same argument holds true if we go went in the lower hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere. Let's say we're going north in the southern hemisphere, um, and I have my still have my omega ve vector pointing upward. Let's do that omega cross v a relative. Okay, the cross product of omega cross v a relative again using the right hand rule. my omega cross v a relative term would uh, vector would point towards the east. So if I'm going north, but I'm in the southern hemisphere, okay, my Coriolis force, which is a negative of the which is in the negative direction of the omega cross v a relative, would move me to the west, to the west. So I'm going, even though I'm going north here, or it would appear to move me to the west. So if I'm going north, I would actually appear to move along a curved path here. Okay. Um, and and that's so that's what we refer to as our Coriolis acceleration, the omega cross v, or Coriolis force. It's a, an appearance because of the you know the rotation of the Earth. And also, more importantly, that the Earth is spherical and objects, as you move away from the equator, the objects have smaller and smaller uh, velocities, right? They're smaller and smaller velocities because they're 
covering a smaller circumference in the same 24 hours as we move from the equator to the north or from the equator to the south. I recommend that you um, check out other videos on YouTube uh, regarding the Coriolis force or Coriolis acceleration as well. Many of them um, engaging um, animations um, and um, that will help you better understand it. Okay, so generally, how do we analyze an object's motion relative to a reference frame that undergoes an arbitrary motion? That is, that reference frame is, is moving, it's accelerating, it's rotating. It's not inertial. Okay, it could be a reference frame on an airplane or a ship, um, even a car, some type of moving vehicle. Well, ideally, you need to account for all these terms that we discussed earlier. So if you're measuring the acceleration relative to that body that you're on, that is translating, that is accelerating uh, or rotating, then you, you really ideally should account for the terms we mentioned before, as well as remember we dropped the alpha cross R term when we were discussing the Earth because we had a constant angular velocity. So we'd also have to incorporate the alpha cross R term um, here, and that then we could apply, so to speak, Newton's second law, F equals MA. So now we're going to look at rigid body planar dynamics. So we have to revisit uh, moment, angular momentum principles as well. And uh, prior to this, we looked at uh, moment, angular momentum principles for particles or for systems of particles, but we didn't necessarily look at uh, an entire rigid body. So let's see, we'll see what happens, but let's review what we did before. So we, sh we said that um, the sum of the moments is equal to the derivative of the angular momentum for a particle, where the angular momentum was given by, it was the moment of momentum, so it was given by r cross mv, uh, just like, similarly, you'd have the moment of a force being R cross F. And um, when we take moments, of course, it's always about a point, a particular point. Um, so if we take the angle of momentum as well, it has to be about a particular point. We also said that if you had a system of particles then we could take uh, we could consider the center of gravity as a particular point and take the moments about the center of gravity of that system of particles and the same relationship would hold as before in that the sum of the moments about the center of mass of that system of particles would be the rate of change or the derivative of the angular momentum um, which is in itself the uh, moment of the linear momentum and the moment about that center of mass. So here we know our H, our angular momentum is still R cross MV. This capital RI would of course be what? The distance from the centroid to the particular particle or from the center of mass to the particular particle that we're talking about. And the derivative of that distance is, of course, the velocity. And then finally, we said that for that system, we could, um, we would have this relationship as well, where the angular momentum about a particular point could be given by the angular momentum about the Excuse me. Yes, correct. 
the angular momentum about the centroid or center of mass plus this r cross mv term where this r now would be the distance from the point o to the centroid or center of mass and this velocity would of course be the velocity of the center of mass okay so you can uh, go back in your notes and look at how we um, derive those and the derivation is also in the text okay so let's quickly look at rotation about a fixed axis we're only going to do one proof um, then we'll move on so if we have a rigid body rotating about some line l naught or l l sub o i guess uh, l sub o um rotating at some angle velocity omega then the omega vector will of course point in this z direction and direction along this line l sub o which we've also chosen as our z coordinate and um let's say we had some elemental mass m sub i you know some particle within that mass that total mass m sub i there are a couple of things we can say okay we know that the velocity of this ith particle because we're rotating about the line lo would be given by omega cross r so it'd be given by omega cross r i r sub i omega of course is omega k okay and the velocity of course is the rate of change of displacement with time so that's where this comes from we can talk about the sum of the moments about point o okay remember that our moment is a vector quantity okay but since our rotation is planar okay we can uh, dot our moment with k and convert it to a scalar because all our moments will be in the k direction so if we dot it with k we'll just end up with a scalar value right uh, we could take the dot product of that moment uh angular momentum relationship right sigma mo equals dho dt this was a vector equation but if we um, take the dot product if we dot both sides with k we end up with a scalar equation so the sum of the moments is rate of change of angular momentum magnitude only we don't have to worry about direction because um, really everything is all our rotations are in the k direction really about the k axis that means about the k axis so recall what was ho the rate of change of angular momentum it's the r cross mv term right r cross mv but we said earlier that our velocity for the ith particle would be omega cross r right so we said that earlier so if we do that dot product remember we dotted both sides of the vector equation to get this so we had ho dot k ho was a vector if we dotted it okay we're going to get something like this here uh, if we incorporate r cross mv right dotted with k if we incorporate this identity u dot v cross w is equal to u cross v dot w then this expression uh, transitions to here to become this one so let's check that out a little bit in more detail so u dot v cross w so it, it says if my k is my u and then v would be the r sub i here and the w would be the k cross r sub i right so the w would be the k cross r sub i so i have u dot v cross w so the k is my u and the v is my r sub i which is a vector so u cross v is going to be k cross r sub i right here right u cross v k cross r sub i dotted with w w was my omega k cross r sub i omega is just a, um, a magnitude here so i don't have to worry we can take it in or out put it in or take it out of the expression not de delete it but just um, move it out of the brackets all right so we could have so remember our w is k cross r sub i so i have my w here and of course 
I took out the um, scalar value omega out of the out of the brackets because it's just a, a factor. I can take the m sub i out of the brackets; it's just a factor. So I end up with I have a vector dotted with itself. So a vector dotted with itself always gives me its magnitude squared. Always, right? Now we can move down here. Let's move down a little bit. And let's look at the k cross r sub i term. Well, k cross, remember the cross product is a cross b is magnitude of a, the magnitude of b, sine of the angle between them. So k cross r sub i is the magnitude of k times the magnitude of r sine of the angle between them. The magnitude of k is, of course, 1. So we see that the cross product k cross r is the magnitude of r sine beta, the angle between them. Of course, the magnitude of r sine beta is also this vertical distance here, right? So I can say that my k cross r sub i magnitude squared, okay, is simply this vertical distance. I can call it r sub i. And guess what? Our definition of moment of inertia from way back when was mi r sub i squared, where r sub i was a perpendicular distance from the line of action to the point, right? from the line of rotation, the line, the axis about which we're talking, to the point. So I could replace all of this expression here by mi ri squared. Remember, ri, r sub i here, is this length from this perpendicular distance from mi to the axis. So it turns out, you know, we went through all of that to show that my um, moment of momentum or my angular momentum term can be written as I sub O, which is the moment of inertia um, of the ith particle. Well, we, we did the summation now, so we're looking at the moment of inertia of all the particles, um, which gives me the moment of inertia of my, my body, really, about the axis or a point on the axis that passes through O times my angle velocity, omega, right? Mi this k cross ri term r squared becomes ri squared that mi ri squared becomes i sub o which is my moment of inertia so bottom line is the moment of the angle of momentum about a point on a fixed axis is given by i o omega or the moment of inertia about that point times omega okay and we can do, uh, oh, <laughs> and of course, we said our moment is the rate of change of angle momentum. So this is where your physics formula comes in. You did it earlier that the sum of the moments is IO times alpha, because if I differentiate this expression, I will get um, IO times the derivative of omega respect to time, which is alpha. So the sum of the moments is I alpha about a fixed point. Okay, so that's the only proof we'll do. But we can also prove, using the same line of reasoning, that that expression, 18.17, also holds true. Using the same line of reasoning, also holds true for the center of mass. So if we look here, the sum of the moments about the center of, of mass is equal to the product of inertia and the angle of acceleration as well. The sum of the moments about the center of mass is equal to the product of the moment of inertia about the center of mass and the angle of acceleration as well. So it's the same proof, or a very similar proof, um, to get m equals i alpha, but not just for any fixed point, but particularly for the center of mass. So if I revisit these expressions that we had for a system of particles, now if we're looking at a continuum okay so we're looking at a, a mass uh, an object you know we can say that the same thing as we did before because a, a continuum is a system of particles but we have to 
we can incorporate uh, or add some some other things as well because we know that let's say the angular momentum of about the fixed point the angular momentum of a point that's fixed h sub o we know that that could be expressed as i times omega i times omega where i is the moment of inertia about that fixed point we also know here this h the h uh, which is angular moment, momentum about the centroid we know that could also be expressed as i omega where i is the moment of inertia about the centroid right an axis through the centroid right when i say the centroid i mean an axis through the center of mass times omega so the same expression holds true but we can sort of incorporate the fact that we know the moment of inertia of different shapes and masses and so on okay finally let's put it all together now so we looked at um, the equations that relate the acceleration um, given a moving reference frame and a fixed reference frame and acceleration relative to the moving reference frame same thing for velocity then we looked at the relationships between um, moment or angular mo angular momentum and moments um, for rigid bodies and we also looked at how newton's law applies to um, accelerating um, rotating reference frames okay so now let's see what we can do with all that information okay so the airplane weighs 830,000 pounds total thrust on its engines during takeoff roll is 208,000 pounds and you're asked to determine the airplane's acceleration and the normal forces exerted on its wheels um, by the runway at A and B during takeoff. Uh, you're also told to neglect the horizontal forces exerted on its wheels. So of course with all these with these types of problems we absolutely have to draw a free body diagram. So let's think about what are the forces we need to worry about on the airplane. Well we clearly we'll have some normal reactions at A and B <clears throat> and we have the weight of the aircraft acting downward. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see, we'll draw these forces in. And then we're going to note a few things. With planar, a few things. With planar dynamics, we know we can apply Newton's laws. We have to be careful um, about where we're applying the Newton's laws. Remember, it's the acceleration F equal MA. The acceleration is at the centroid. Um, we have to be careful if we have a moving reference frame or not. Well, currently we're using the uh, fixed reference frame, fixed to the earth. Um, we have to be think about rotation now. So earlier we just proved that the sum of the moments for a rigid body, the sum of the moments about its centroid is also equal to I times alpha, where I is the moment of inertia about its centroid, really about an axis passing through its centroid. And we also show that we could apply that m equal i alpha also about any fixed point. Okay. And there is a relationship between those two moments that we um, looked at as well. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, let's, so let's go ahead and proceed. So we will have, we can look at our Newton's law in the x direction. Clearly in the y direction, there's no acceleration, so we can apply Newton's law in the y direction too, as we always, as we have been doing. So in the x direction, uh, simple equation, we end up with the acceleration being the thrust over the mass, giving us 8.07 feet per second squared. In the y direction, there's no acceleration. So we have A plus B minus W. Let's go back to our, uh, we have A and B going up, W is going down. So we have A plus B minus w equals zero um, the third equation that we have is the sum of the moments is i times alpha some of the moments where about the centroid 
So we can take moments about the center of mass and we'll get 60 plus 68b minus 16a equals zero. And let's go back and take a look. Well, a is going um, clockwise and it's 16 feet from the centroid. B is going counterclockwise, it's 68 feet from the centroid. T would give us a counterclockwise as well, and it is six feet. It's perpendicular distance from the centroid is six feet. So T and B are both counterclockwise. So let's go back again. So treating counterclockwise as positive, I have 60 plus 68B then 16A would be the moment that A produces, which was clockwise, about the centroid. So essentially what we have here, two unknowns, right? Because we know T and we know W. So we can solve for A and B there. So that was a very simple sort of warm-up example. Let's look at example 18.2. We have a homogeneous circular disk with radius R, mass M released from rest on the inclined plane. You're given the moment of inertia of the disk about its center half m r i equals half m r squared so we want the disk angular acceleration we're asked to find the disk angular acceleration as it rolls down the surface so it's rolling down the surface so let's uh note that this is a given so if our answer has an m or r squared we're okay um First step, as usual, do a free body diagram. We have our weight of the disc acting downward, mg. We can resolve that weight into its components that are perpendicular and parallel to the plane. So I have mg cosine beta, mg sine beta, respectively. I have my frictional force. They didn't tell us it was a smooth plane, so we have to incorporate our frictional force, f. And I have my normal force, my normal reaction from the plane onto the disk, N. All right, so we can now incorporate our equations of motion. So along the plane, I'll have mg sine beta minus f. mg sine beta was going down. mg sine beta was going down. f was going up the plane. So I end up with mg sine beta minus f being ma, but the a is the a sub x, it's the a of the centroid, but just the x component along the plane. Okay. We could also do the um, perpendicular um, Cartesian direction and apply f equal ma again, and we would end up with the normal force being mg cosine beta. Applying m equals i alpha, well, about the centroid, um, we simply get r times f, where r was the radius, and f is the frictional force. The normal force goes towards the center, so it has no moment. And of course, the weight acts through the center, so it has no moment about the center. So where do I go from here? Well, we're, our, our solution is to, our objective is to find the angular acceleration. Okay. So we can relate the angular acceleration of the disk to the linear acceleration of the disk because, you know, we did, um, you know, with our original two points in a rigid body relationships, we found out that the acceleration of a rolling disk was always given by r times alpha. So we know that the acceleration of the linear acceleration is related to the angular acceleration by these two at the center um, by this relationship, relationship three. So remember, what am I asked to find alpha? So I didn't know a sub x, I didn't know alpha, okay? And I also did not know what f was, right? So those are my three unknowns. Beta was given, mg is given, m is given, right? We know all of that. R is the radius of this, so that's a given because we're given i as half m r squared. So everything else is given. So we have three unknowns, three equations. Again, our unknowns would have been what? a sub x, alpha, and f. 
So we can do a little bit of elimination and substitution and we'll get alpha in terms of our knowns with the G, R and beta. Okay. All right, and we're going to wrap it up with uh, active example 18.3. So this time we have a slender bar of mass M that's sliding on a smooth floor and wall. And it has a counterclockwise angle velocity omega. And we're asked for the bar's angular acceleration. So we're not given much here, we're just the mass M, counterclockwise angle velocity omega, and the bar's acceleration. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this one. This one. Oh, we have the length of the bar as well, L, and it's at an angle theta. So these are all given. So if our answer has in theta, L, omega, and M, that's okay. All right, so let's look at our free body diagram. So we have the weight acting down at the centroid, center of mass, which is a halfway, um, half the length of the bar up or down. And we have normal forces um, from the walls onto the bar, P and N. These we don't know, we just introduce them. So immediately we have two unknowns right there. Okay, let's keep going. Let's go ahead and apply F equals MA at the center. Remember F equals MA for rigid body, the A is only at the centroid. So if we sum our forces, oh, one more thing. I uh, forgot to mention that it's a smooth wall and floor, smooth floor and wall, right? So we don't have to worry about friction. Okay. So now we apply F equal MA. We know the acceleration at the center would be given by, um, we don't know what this direction is, but we can uh, give it two components, A sub X and A sub Y, respectively in the X and Y direction. So if I sum forces in the x, I get p equals ma sub x. Remember, p was going in the x direction, and I have a sub x in the x direction. In the y, I have n. Remember, n was going up, mg is going down. So n minus mg equals m a sub y. But guess what? I've introduced an a sub x and a sub y. So those are two more unknowns. So here I have four equations and two unknowns. So that's not enough, clearly. So I move to my moment equation. So if I take moments about the centroid, I end up with this expression, equation three. And my N gives me my normal force, which is going upward here, gives me a counterclockwise moment. It's perpendicular distance from the line of action to the point would be a half L sine theta. So we get n times a half L sine theta positive, and the P gives me a clockwise moment, and its perpendicular distance from its line of action to the point would be a half L cosine theta. So I end up with this expression being I alpha. I is the moment of inertia about the centroid. This can be found in tables. This is well established for common geometries like slender bars and so on. So now I have three equations, but how many unknowns do I have? Well, I introduced a third unknown, I'm sorry, a fifth unknown alpha. So now I have three equations in five unknowns. So to get ourselves out of that dilemma, we have to move to, we can move to the kinematic relationships. And guess what? If we look at the kinematic relationships between the accelerations at different points, we see that we have some information here that we, we could utilize because we know the direction of the acceleration at B. We know the direction of the acceleration at A. If at A is horizontal, at B is vertical. So let's make use of that. So if I looked at the relationship between the acceleration at the centroid and the acceleration at A, for example, I'm going to have something like this. I'm going to have A sub A I as being the acceleration of the point A. Um, omega was given to us, you know, so that's unknown. So in this expression here, I have introduced one additional unknown, which is a sub a. But this is a vector equation. So this is actually two equations, two algebraic equations. So now I have 
five equations in six unknowns. Five equations in six unknowns. Because I had one additional unknown, but I have two more algebraic equations here. So we can go to, we didn't utilize the information here. So let's try and utilize that to get our uh, additional equation. So if I look at the acceleration of the centroid again, I can express in terms of the acceleration at B. Now, if we look at this equation, we've utilized all these unknowns already. Uh, the alpha, you know, we can express that as alpha K. That was an unknown before, so we're okay. But the new unknown that we introduced was A sub B. A sub B. We know its direction is A sub B, J. Um, everything else is was already accounted for. So guess what? Now I have two more equations, two more equations, and one more unknown. So let's go back to here. So here we had uh, six and seven, six equations, seven unknowns. Now I have eight equations and eight unknowns. And it's a lot to uh, solve uh, sort of without a computer, but you could work through as long as you have the same amount of equations as unknowns, you can work through and solve all your unknowns. So our kinematic relationships, in addition to Newton's laws and our angular momentum principle, all three combine in this example to give us um, our solution. And our solution becomes 3g over 2l sine theta. I encourage you to do the practice problem here as well as the homework problems.